Hello, Peter here from Not Just a Geek. Apologies that this video is somewhat delayed. It summarises the usage stats for our far infrared heating system in the months of March and April, and also describes some control changes we've made along the way. At the end, I've also described a kind of summary of our experience of using far infrared for all of our heating this past winter. If you aren't familiar with the series, we've been trialling far infrared heating in our house. Details of how we've configured the system and what far infrared is can be found in the introduction video, linked in the description below. The key points to be aware of is that control is through network connected relays and management of these relays is through a home automation product called Home Assistant. This allows us to create virtual thermostats and to tweak their behaviour to see what difference this makes to both comfort and end usage. Further to this, we can configure complex automations to further optimise system performance. So, let's first look at the changes we've made in terms of control. Initially, we split our heating energy into four categories, each of which have separate costs which make it easy to calculate the overall cost for heating. They cover battery, solar and both peak or off-peak grid usage. In February this year, we noted that a lot of the heating was coming from solar. It was a very sunny February, but actually this was often boosted heating where the rooms were already heated to a comfortable temperature and we were taking advantage of the excess solar to kind of store some energy in the fabric. As a consequence, we've now added another tariff to our utility meter and home assistant. This is important when comparing heating with other fuel options. If we include this boosted energy in our heating, especially at the edge points of the year, we find actually that it wouldn't map to our actual heating needs. If we were to heat the property with a different fuel type, we wouldn't actually be using that extra energy. And this makes comparisons against other fuels, for example gas, more difficult. It also influences our decision in terms of when to change tariff. Energy that's going into heating in boost mode is energy that isn't going into the battery or being sent out to the grid. And that could colour the decision we make in terms of tariff. By separating this out, we were able to make much more reasonable decisions about both the performance and the best tariff for us. And as it happens, this led to us deciding to move over to Octopus Flux. Additionally, we've tweaked the heating controls for when panels should be activated. Specifically, we've required a minimum runtime for the units. This is because when there is a reasonable gap between runs of a panel, which we've experienced several times this spring, then the panels often don't warm up to their maximum temperature before the target air temperature in the room is reached. Infrared emissivity of the panels is affected by their running temperature. Specifically, higher surface temperatures lead to a higher percentage of heat transfer as infrared. To ensure we are benefiting from infrared heating of the building fabric, rather than simply heating the air by convection, we are wanting to ensure that run times are long enough to enable the panels to reach this optimum temperature. It's too late this year to see what difference this makes, but come autumn we'll see how valuable these changes are. And our final tweak for this period was the introduction of heating and cooling season helpers within Home Assistant. These are effectively just virtual switches that our automations use to decide what behaviour to operate under. This is to ensure we don't boost the heating in the rooms during summer, a scenario which could easily occur if air conditioning was running to cool a room at the same time that the boost helper was telling us that we needed to boost the temperature in the room because we cooled it below that target temperature. Now, let's have a look at the normal update for usage stats for the months of March and April. So in March, we used 453.3 kilowatt hours of electricity for heating. 183.8 of this came from the grid, with 126.8 of this being peak time electricity. Battery-wise, we used 222 kilowatt hours, and we gained seven, uh, sorry, 11 kilowatt hours from solar and 38 kilowatt hours from boost. In terms of emissions, 
uh, our electricity that was consumed from the grid was at 170.9 grams CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. And because of the solar uh, part of the far infrared heating, actually the, inf the heating was at 152 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. This compares favourably with a gas boiler, which would be 215 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, especially given that we find that we need roughly uh, 1.8 to 2 times more gas to get the same level of comfort in a room. Uh, in terms of unit price, we found that over this heating season, the price of electricity averaged out at 14p per kilowatt hour of heat. Um, which compares reasonably well with the 10p per kilowatt hour of uh, cost for gas that's currently available on the various uh, tariffs. Um, it's worth noting that you have to bear in mind that we would use more gas to get the same level of comfort. To highlight this, we use 453 kilowatt hours of electricity for heating in March. If we'd used gas, we would have used 752 kilowatt hours of gas. Uh, if we had heated the home with gas, the forecast price would have been £75, whereas we actually spent £64.83. Uh, and this is excluding the fact that we've also saved by not paying a gas standing charge. In April, uh, it was a warmer month and sunnier month, um, though still a little bit cooler than we might have liked for April, so we used 234 kilowatt hours for heating. 17.98 um, came from the grid only 8.28 of this was peak. From the battery we used 133.59, from solar we used 15.61, and there was 67.78 kilowatt hours of electricity from boosting using excess solar. This led to lower emissions generally, so the grid was cleaner in April as well, at 154 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, and this led to us achieving 144 grams of CO2 per equivalent per kilowatt hour for our heating. This compares, as usual, with the 215 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour from a gas boiler, and once again, bear in mind that we would use more gas to get the same level of comfort as we do with um, fire and bread. In terms of the costs, so it cost us £13.61 pence for our heating in April. Uh, that was a, worked out at a equivalent unit price of six pence per kilowatt hour, so less than the various tariffs for gas. Um, if we'd been heating with gas, we would have required 301 kilowatt hours and we would have anticipated paying £30.10. So, what have we learnt from using Farm for it for our heating this winter season? Well, it works. It provides comfort at lower temperatures than other heating systems, and it's incredibly responsive. The tech's also comparatively dumb. There's no moving parts, there's no noise, uh, maintenance should effectively be zero. We have noticed a few things looking at the statistics. One is that the living room and dining room were our largest consumers of heating energy in the house. And this isn't surprising. Uh, we have three young children. My wife's been at home on maternity leave this year. Um, and so daytime occupancy is very high. And actually the living room and the dining room are the two spaces that we occupy the most in the day. They're also joined. So, you know, if you're heating the living room, you will lose some space into the dining room through open doors, etc. Um, we're looking into how we might improve that for next year. Uh, one option directly links to the fact that our property faces south. Um, there's quite a large quantity of glazing, so it can get quite hot in the summer, and we're looking at cooling options for these rooms, which I hope to discuss in a future video. Given the high de heat demand in the living room, a mini-split air-to-air heat pump might well resolve both the cooling needs of the property and also uh, significantly reduce the energy requirements for heating as well. We're not planning to move to an air-to-air -air system throughout the property. It just doesn't make sense given how low the usage is in some of these rooms. I hope you found this video interesting. Uh, if you have any questions, please do ask about them in the comments. I'd really like to share more information with you, especially if they relate to fire infrared heating, but also if they relate to renewables or home automation, or our experiences with any of these systems this winter. Great. Bye.